one more guy, just one more guy. That's all they need. They are one key player away from becoming a title contender this next season. You are locked on Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Nittany Lions your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode is sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That is linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. My name is Zach Seiko, your host as always. And Adisa Isaac is coming back. Penn State defensive end. Good season from him, and we're going to talk about why that's so important and why Penn State is one key player away, who that key player is to come back for the Nittany Lions so that they can tend, so that they can contend for a title this upcoming season. And Penn State men's basketball drops another game back-to-back losses, but this time they lost to number one ranked Purdue out in the palestra, the implications of that game. And I join Locked On Big Ten. We'll talk with Nate Dickinson in the final segment uh, about Penn State and the Rose Bowl, Penn State in the offseason for football, and a little further explanation of Penn State men's basketball. Uh, so Adisa Isaac is coming back. He announced it on his social media. And this is huge for Penn State. I, I mean, how could it not be? You're getting a veteran. You're getting a starter back. You're getting someone that showed flashes of what they're capable of because I, I think that he had a good season, but it certainly wasn't his best that he could have had. And I think his best is still yet to come as he's coming off of that injury redshirted. Um, he's got plenty of eligibility. He still technically has multiple years of eligibility left. So I'm anticipating that this is going to be his last season, but it's good that he still has one more run with the Nittany Lions before he moves on to the NFL. I think if he would have went on, I, I would say that he was about a fourth or a fifth round pick. Um, given that he's so athletic in that NFL teams at one point in time, he was a first round pick. He was a first or a second rounder, but then the injury happened. And now here we are, but you're returning both starting defensive ends and the way that Penn state likes to rotate defensive lines. Now you have that. So chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac are going to be both back. You, you have the best edge rushers from a season ago coming back and you did lose Nick Tarbert. And that made this move all the more important because you were losing a veteran. Tar Burton in himself, in his own right, was a starter, um, but he was more of an edge setter. He was a run defender, but this is a big get for the pass rush. Uh, uh, getting Chop Robinson out of the transfer portal, having him back in another uh, another year for Penn State, and then Adisa Isaac to come back uh, is a huge get for both of them. So, But losing Tar Burton to the draft, that's what makes this even more important. Now, this is a boost for not only the pass rush, but the run defense as well, because as we saw in the Rose Bowl, Adisa Isaac probably had one of his best games. I, I would say Auburn was his best game, but the Rose Bowl, to have five tackles, uh, didn't register any sacks, and it, it was a slow season when it came to sacks. Adisa had only four, and but where he was really good was in the backfield. He was just disrupting plays. Uh, he was a factor in both the run and the pass, but now you have both him and Chop Robinson uh, being factors in the pass rush. So uh, when this group has Adisa Isaac, Chop Robinson, you can throw in a mean van over, deny Dennis Sutton, who has all the potential in the world, Zariah Fisher, Smith Vilbert's expected to be back, and Fisher coming off that injury. This is a really good group, and you have the class of 2023 coming in as well. I don't know how much of an impact they will make. This is a solid group at defensive end and a huge boost by getting Adisa Isaac back. Despite losing Nick Tarburton, you would have liked both of them back. However, if I had to pick one, I would say Adisa Isaac, if I'm being honest. Just uh, all the potential in the world, uh, and if he makes, if he has a good season, I think he can make it back to his first-round potential uh, the given the case. So the other key player that Penn state needs back, and that's Curtis Jacobs at the linebacker position. And this is a must. There's no really other way to say it. If they lose him, that is a huge blow to the defense. But if I'm being honest, getting Curtis Jacobs back is, is way more important than getting Adisa Isaac back because they're, they're both starters, but Curtis Jacobs 
the the linebacker core really needs him more than Adisa. Then the defensive line really needs Adisa Isaac because of guys like Deny Dennis Sutton. I know what you're thinking. Okay, Abdul Carter is there and Kobe King, but you're already losing Jonathan Sutherland. You don't know if Charlie Catcher's coming back. Um, what's uh, Jamari Budden? Do you think that he can have an, an increased role next season? Uh, how are the freshmen going to factor in? There's Tamir Robinson, of course. There's Tony Rojas. Do you think that they're going to be able to duplicate something and, and be ready to plug and play like an Abdul Carter was? That, that's, those odds are tough. But Curtis Jacobs really solidified that on that off ball linebacker position once again, that on ball linebacker position once again. There's the Sam, the Mike, and the Will. And Abdul Carter was on the bench because Curtis Jacobs was that off ball linebacker. They started him there. Then they said, all right, we got to find a way to get Abdul Carter on the field. And then Curtis Jacobs flipped back over to the on ball linebacker where he was primarily a season ago. And the reason Curtis Jacobs is all that much more important is because of the versatility. You need that versatility, someone who can slide in basically at any position, be a starter, be effective anywhere, because if Abdul Carter goes out, I don't know if someone's ready to provide that kind of flair that Curtis Jacobs can, and then hopefully you can have a backup at that spot. I think this provide this not only provides depth, this provides leadership as well because Kobe King is still fairly young and inexperienced. Abdul Carter in itself, even though Abdul Carter is probably the best athlete on the defense, he's still young. He's still got to grow up and do some learning to do. Um, but he's wearing that number 11 well, I must say. Once Curtis Jacobs, I'm going to speak it into existence, once he confirms that he's coming back, uh, this defense is absolutely set. Because you have Abdul Carter, you have King, you have Tyler Elsden, who now you can have a little more flexibility where you're going to move him. You can cycle him in with Kobe King still. I could see him playing a little bit of strong side linebacker with Curtis Jacobs, but that's who you want as your starter. And all the more importantly, your second season with Manny Diaz, we saw how much the defense progressively got better as the season went along, how much they learned and how much more comfortable they were as the season progressed and uh, Curtis Jacobs coming back will add that. And I think uh, like Adisa Isaac, we're talking up his potential second round, potentially a first. I think Curtis Jacobs has that too written all over him. Curtis Jacobs, man, the, the disrespect that he got throughout this season, not being named to any award watch list, he'd rack up 14 tackles in a game. And it's just like, okay, uh, not, not a big, a big deal to us as Penn state fans and, and Penn state uh, media covering those games. But nationally it's like, wow, well, he just kind of flew under the radar. And I don't think that's fair. I, I think Curtis Jacobs is much better than people give, give him credit for. Um, and I think the defense will all be so much better off because then you have that reassurance at linebacker and then you don't kind of have to figure out who's going to gel together. You get all three starters back at the linebacking core and it's LBU. <laughs> you need that. Uh, and especially in Manny Diaz's defense, since they love to blitz so much. Um, and something else I've noticed before we go to break here, uh, just in general, there really hasn't been that much turnover with this team. It's been really refreshing uh, the way that not many key players have hopped into the transfer portal. Sure, you've had some guys transferred out, uh, and that's expected given the way the college sports are nowadays. Um, and you also had all the expected players, maybe a couple guys that you wouldn't expect to move on necessarily, but re really no surprises here uh, out of the bag of tricks, right? I think that's what it boils down to is that James Franklin has been able to keep this roster very much intact and very much poised for a national title run. He's not only selling the program to the players that are eventually going to be here, but the players that are here now and finding that stability with them. Olu Fashion, who could have easily went into the draft, he's coming back. That takes a lot of work to get a guy who's projected as a top 10 pick to come back for another season with Penn state. So I, I think that's important to bring up here in general, Penn state has not lost any players that you're like scratching your head and you're going, man, uh, there's a problem here. Things are in shambles. No, this is probably one of the better periods for the program under James Franklin. And, and that's saying something given we saw what happened in 2016, the potential that 2017 17 team that was really good 
And now we're going into 2023 and Penn State, I think, is right around that level. Once again, I think they're definitely at that level. Uh, I'll explain a little more in the final segment when I talk to Nate Dickinson of Locked On Big Ten about the potential of this team, the true potential of it. But getting Adisa Isaac back is a huge help. And once can Curtis Jacobs confirms that he's coming back, that's even bigger for this team next season is locked on Nittany lions. When we return, we're going to talk about Penn state men's basketball coming off of a loss against Purdue in the palestra, the implications of that game. And I, I don't know if, if this team's a, a tournament team anymore. Let's discuss that next. Today's episode is sponsored by LinkedIn jobs as a small business owner or hiring manager. You know, that success in 2023 all depends on the team members that you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs with LinkedIn jobs. You can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post, company, and the 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. Identify the most qualified candidates on LinkedIn Jobs and connect with them fast and for free. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all in one platform. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That is linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to the show. Thanks again for making Locked On Nittany Lines your first listen every day. Make sure to check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. It's basketball season, baby. Football is wrapping up. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. Plus, hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And once again, if I haven't said it already, thank you so much for 600 plus subscribers on YouTube. If you haven't already, if you're listening to the audio version of this, I really appreciate it. Give me a review. Let me know how I can make the show better for you. Any feedback you'd like to share. And if you haven't already, go subscribe over on the YouTube channel if you want to watch the show as well. Penn State men's basketball loses yet another game. And this is really the gauntlet for a Penn State team that just doesn't have it uh, in the front court. We, we knew that height and size were going to be a problem for Penn State. And it showed losing to Michigan on the road and now Purdue at a neutral site. Uh, 76 to 63. And Penn State men's basketball just might not be a tournament team this season. And I think when when I had uh, the first kind of read on this team, you know, what were they going to be? And we, they, they're exactly what we knew they were going to be. They were going to play up-tempo. They were going to shoot the ball a lot. But they truly live and die by the three. And I can sit here and say that Penn State can beat any team Penn State can also lose to any team. And I think some of those surprising losses may show up at points in time. And they're now 11 and five overall, two and three in conference. Um, they were leading 37 to 31 at the half. Like I said, they can go toe to toe with any team. But the second they start missing shots, they, they get streaky. They lose. Uh, Penn State had no answer for the pick and roll. Uh, Zach Eady, seven foot four. 290 pounds. I, I don't even know that he's human, but you can't let this happen. We saw Hunter Dickinson score 17 points the other night. Okay, that's fine. He got his. Uh, but in, in the case of Zach Eady, 30 points, 14 of 21 shooting, 13 rebounds. That's just that's just unreal right there. And, and you're going to run into that uh, at points in time. Not everyone that Penn State's going to play has, has a small ball team. Uh, Fletcher Lawyer had 17 points. Braden Smith had 15, and that's the pick and roll in action. Uh, what what really burns me is just how efficient Purdue was. Um, they The turnovers were the same, so Penn State didn't play a sloppy game, but it was just really tough for, for Penn State to defend this. And, and they shot 44% from three-point range. Uh, Penn State, uh, as a team, shot in the mid-30s, and right there that shows. So uh, they got to find a way to distribute the ball better. Uh, there, there's also some things that need to step up as well. And it's specific players because Jalen Pickett continues to just play out of his mind. 
And I, I say that he is in the running for Big Ten Player of the Year. I say that he's in running to be named first team all Big Ten. I, I think he should get national recognition as well. He should definitely be in the All-America conversation. And this sucks. It sucks because it's such a waste. It is such a waste for somebody to go out there and basically average almost a triple-double at least recently just in the Palestra game against Purdue, 26 points, nine rebounds, eight assists. And he's doing that in consecutive games. Like he is doing that pretty consistently. Seth Lundy is your, your secondary guy, uh, had 14. Okay. Very respectable. Then who else stepped up? No one, nobody stepped up. That's the short answer. Penn state lost this game because they couldn't knock down shots and your best shooters went absolutely ice cold. Where was Andrew Funk? One for eight. Penn State uh, actually made it a point about how Funk played in multiple state title games, went to Archbishop Wood, that's in Pennsylvania, and actually played at the Palestra. Those were the that's where those state championship games were held. So it's like, oh, this is a homecoming for him. He's gonna have a great game, right? Uh, no, didn't seem like he was that comfortable. He, he made one shot earlier in the game, and then after that, he wasn't to be heard from again. And then how about Miles Dredd? Where was Miles Dredd? Two for five uh, from the field. Didn't have that good of a game either. Uh, your next leading scorer was a true freshman. Why is Evan Mahaffey your next best guy? That's fine. You get some energy from him off of the bench. You saw a quality minutes out of him, 19 of them in this game. But <laughs> Andrew, the, the X factor here is Andrew Funk and, and Miles Dredd as well. It, it seems like when Penn State has Andrew Funk and Miles Dredd uh, turning in a bad game, Penn State plays poorly. But when when they are unstoppable, Penn State as a team uh, is unstoppable. So I'll talk about this a little more in the next segment. Uh, it, the bottom line is they live by the three, they die by the three. Um, and, and that's just going to be the case all season. Hopefully they can get red hot by the NCAA tournament and the more importantly the Big Ten tournament because I don't think um, the record alone is going to get them in. They just, right now, they are not a tournament team. This is not a team. This is a team that I, if I'm looking from an opponent's perspective, this is a team that I want to play because I defend the three very well. And that's why Penn State seemed to be so good to open up the season because they were making their shots, but they didn't really have all that much resistance when they shot from three. Now you're finding that teams are very good at, at defending the basketball when it's being distributed around. They're, they're quicker, they're faster, they can move with those screens. They don't allow guys to easily get open, and you got to find a way to, to adjust to that. Um, but uh, Penn State can get red hot, and they can get ice cold as well, and we've seen that in games from the night to day. They can go from one to the other just like that, and we're seeing it kind of uh, go from hot to cold rather than cold to hot cold to hot and, and look at Illinois. They can beat good teams, but uh, that's, that's really where they stand right now. I I'm not buying, I'm selling them uh, as a tournament team. I don't think they're that right now. Uh, I will tell you about the kind of the key player for them that could turn it all around and make them a more balanced team in the upcoming segment uh, up next for them. They play at home against Indiana. That's a ranked Indiana team. And they just got trace Jackson Davis back. Uh, if Penn State was playing Indiana without him, I, I think they'd have a better shot at this, but I, I'm not all that sure that Penn State's going to do very well against this kind of Indiana team. They are very balanced, uh, and they got some guys that can give them headaches in the front court, especially with how diverse of a game that Jackson Davis plays. Uh, Would have been a better matchup for them. Uh, if he was not in the lineup, let's just say that. And as Locked On Nittany Lines, we're talking with Nate Dickinson of Locked On Big Ten next. Today's episode is sponsored by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From pro and college football to pro and college basketball, we've got it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at Bet Online as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. 
Hey, you're listening into Locked On Big Ten, everything you need to know about the conference every day of the week. Zach Seiko from Locked On Nittany Lions joins us here now to discuss the Rose Bowl, some Penn State basketball, just everything going on. A meeting long in the making as we've been trying to make this work out over the last week here since Penn State won that big game in Pasadena. Zach, thanks again for joining us here for a couple of minutes. Let's start by talking about that second half. Penn State goes in tied, ends up big winners. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit weird now to talk about X's and O's a week after, but just real quickly recap for us what you thought won that game for the Nittany Lions. Pass rush, pressure. Uh, Penn State had five of its six sacks come in uh, in the second half against Utah and its backup quarterback. Uh, that was the second factor going for it is that Cam Rising did not play in the majority of the second half. And I feel like we missed out on a better Rose Bowl in general. That's just me being a college football fan. And I've actually gotten some flack and it seems like I picked up some controversy by my comments saying like, look, the Rose Bowl would have been better had Cam Rising played. Like he, he did a good enough job to at least may, uh, maintain Utah's competitiveness in, in some sort of sense. I think Penn State was always going to win at the end of the day. It was just a matter of how much. Uh, so I'm disappointed we didn't get to see a closer game. And I just I just don't like watching Penn State. You know, Penn State winning is always a great day. But when when you beat up on JV players, you know, beating Akron or somebody like that, beating Central Michigan is not the same thing as beating Maryland or or Utah, obviously. But beating Utah's backups uh, just didn't have the same feeling for me. But uh, the pass rush did that. Uh, Penn State's offense, the ground game really got going. And Sean Clifford had a perfect day. I think the something that might get lost in all of this is that Sean Clifford played the best game of, of arguably his career. Uh, and and the deep ball was a struggle. He he somehow managed to fix that over the course of a month. Um, and, and Utah secondary really missed Clark Phillips the third. So kind of all those things combined together, uh, Sean Clifford playing flawlessly, the ground game being able to at least provide a, a stable, you know, a stable foundation for Penn State, and then the pass rush just coming alive in the second half. Well, the next logical step as far as progression for the program would to beat either Michigan or Ohio State. Penn State won every other game it played this season. Uh, that's a little bit of a tall task, though, Zach. What are the building blocks that end up making that a reality if you're trying to get there in the next couple of seasons here? Well, in 2024-25, we know that it's going to be 12 teams, so the window opens for everybody uh, rather than getting into the small four-team window. Uh, if you ask me, uh, right now at this time, you know, we're starting off 2023. I think Penn State can make uh, the college football playoff in the next season, not the 12 team. I'm talking still the four team uh, coming up in this 2023, 24 season. Uh, I think all the building blocks are there. You get back guy, two guys in the backfield that can be Heisman contenders, realistically singleton more so than Katron Allen, but both of them. Um, Drew Aller is supposed to be kind of the saving grace for Penn state at the quarterback position. Like, Oh, he's, he's the next piece. I hope so. I hope his development's gone well enough. Uh, James Franklin compared it because he coached for the Packers. Uh, for some people that don't know that he coached when Brett Farr was handing the baton to Aaron Rodgers and said that Sean Clifford and Drew Aller kind of reminded him that of that in some sort of sense. So uh, no, Drew Aller isn't Aaron Rodgers tomorrow, but I, I think there was that process of like, hey, let's develop the young guy and get him in a situation where he can be most successful. He has that with an offensive line. He has that with Singleton and Allen in the backfield. And then Manny Diaz, year two, all those guys that are coming back, they are now in that system. They're ready to take over. And I think the defense can be even better than what it was this past season. Exciting stuff coming up for Penn State in, again, that 14 playoff year. And then, of course, especially when they expand more and get a really, really good shot at making the playoffs on years where they can do well what they did this season. But it's basketball season now. Zach Zaco with us from Locked On Nittany Lions. We talked preseason with you, Zach, about this Nittany Lion team, the veteran experience behind it. And it's proven to be pretty helpful in the early parts of this year. We are right now, it's just we talk coming off of a loss against Purdue here tonight. But Penn State's still right there on the bubble of the NCAA tournament. Where do you think this team needs to get better to make that push? Yeah, Penn State is, and I think I said this this the exact same sentence the last time we talked, Nate, about Penn State men's basketball. They live by the three. They truly die by the three. Um, when they are ice cold shooting, when they're in the low 30s, mid 30s, they're not going to get it done. Uh, it, it feels like when Andrew Funk 
particularly has a bad game, Penn State as a team has a bad game. When he has a good to great game, Penn State has a good to great game. It seems like he's really the true X factor. Um, but they're going to continue to get burned in the front court. They really have no response for that. Uh, Zach Eady is a mountain of a man. I, I totally get that. You know, he had 30 points. He was efficient from, you know, a field goal percentage standpoint. Uh, and Penn State got out rebounded, but you didn't see that against Michigan so much. You didn't see Hunter Dickinson have an all world performance. He was good. He was tough to stop. He just, he got his, uh, I felt like Zach Eady feasted and, and that was, was a little disappointing given that Dickinson was a little bit held in check. He was slightly limited and Eady goes off for 30 and, and he's basically unguardable, unstoppable, whatever you want to call it. But Penn State could have easily won this game had they knocked down some more shots. I mean, they were winning at the end of the first half and Purdue made the necessary adjustments. So that concerns me a little bit. Uh, I feel like Penn state can still beat anybody, but that's only if they're going to come and shoot 50% plus in a game. Uh, Cause they definitely have their weaknesses, but I think they can beat anybody when they're hot, but they can also lose to anybody when they're ice cold. Is there another option, whether or not Penn state's going to it or not, if the three isn't falling, do you think there is another option, another thing that they could try to go to, to get some production on offense? They're trying, uh, they, this is just their, <laughs> it's where they are with other assets that they have. They, Micah Shrewsbury, uh, built through the transfer portal. Cause he came in and he couldn't build a recruiting class his first year, uh, and, and work with the players that he has. What I love the most about Micah Shrewsbury is that he built his system around his current group of talent. So right now that talent is Jalen Pickett, who's averaging, you know, I think over 25 points a game, at least as of late. Um, he's almost getting triple doubles night in, night out. Like he's your focal point. You have that all around guy like a Luka Doncic to the, Don uh, to the Dallas Mavericks, where he's your go-to guy. He's your everything. He does it all. And then you have some complimentary pieces. You're just not getting enough out of those complimentary pieces. You need Andrew Funk to give you 10 to 15. You need Seth Lundy to maybe give you 20 some nights. And that's just been scaled back. Seth Lundy's giving you 10 to 15 and Andrew Funk's giving you, well, just this past game three and uh, in other nights, you know, about five to 10. So that's not going to cut it. If Jalen Pickett's going to continue to have these performances, you need those complimentary pieces to step up. I, I think if somebody can really ch change the dynamic of the offense, it's Keba Jai. And Keba Jai is just showing his inexperience. He's young. The Big Ten is a big boy league. It, it's full of bigger players. You're going to see giant front courts. And Keba Jai is the biggest player they have standing at six foot 11. But he, he's showing just how small he is in terms of stature right now, just given that he's a true freshman. Uh, I think by the end of the season, if he comes around, if he starts to get a little better and Penn State's trying to, they're trying to do that for him. They're trying to get him minutes that progressively build him up. But as of right now, he's just kind of still far behind the eight ball at this point in time. From now, or from back when we talked to now here as we've started the season, Zach, when you, talk, when you talked to us last time, it was, hey, let's make the tournament. Let's prove some of the doubters wrong who pick us at the bottom of the Big Ten. On their way to doing that, our expectations changed at all? Do you feel like this team's any better or worse than at the beginning of the season? They're kind of about where I thought they'd be, you know, losing the teams like Michigan and Purdue. They're just not good matchups. Uh, they have Indiana coming up. I don't think that uh, they're going to get a win against Indiana either. But look what they did to Illinois. They they beat the lights out of Illinois at Illinois. Uh, so, like I said, this is a team that truly can beat some of the better teams in all of college basketball. But I also worry about that loss that's going to come back to bite them where it's like, man, they... <laughs> I think that's the Michigan State game at this point in time because they should have beat that team. They were expected to beat that team, and they lost to them at home. So we've seen it happen, but I think they can come around, and they can beat a team like Purdue if they meet, if they meet them again. Again, look at the first half. It's there. I just don't think the necessary adjustments were made in the second half at the Palestra. Um, but uh, I don't want to see them play against bigger teams. That's obviously their weakness, their kryptonite. That's no secret. Um, but when they play some more balanced teams, got, uh, teams that fit more of Penn State's mold, they play fast. They like to shoot. I feel like Penn State can outshoot those other teams. Um, they just got to find a way to pick up the pace against bigger teams. And because they were trying to do that, I saw Jalen Pickett throughout the night kind of saying like, hey, let's push, let's push. Zach Eady's back there. He's tired. Uh, but it, it, didn't, it didn't ultimately result in a win. 
Zach Seiko with Locked On Nittany Lions joining us here on Locked On at Big Ten. Nittany Lions, at some points at least, definitely showing that they are talented enough to be an NCAA tournament team. We'll see if they end up building up the resume to actually make it by March. Zach, thanks again for joining us here. We'll talk to you again at some point before then, I know. And of course, be sure to subscribe to Locked On Nittany Lions if you haven't already, wherever you're getting your podcasts. We'll talk to you soon, Zach. Hey, thanks for having me on, Nate. It's always great to talk with you. One final time, it's Zach Sago with Locked On Nittany Lines. Thanks for checking out another episode of the show. If you liked it, please like it. Please share it with friends and family. Comment. I, I want you to comment if you think Penn State is a tournament team or if you think that they'll fold and they don't make it into March Madness this upcoming season. That's kind of the next debate here uh, with Penn State football winding down, of course. But the transfer portal's heating up. And key players are coming in. We've already seen Devin Carter from NC State commit to Penn State. And now they're looking at other key guys along the defensive line. They obviously want another wide receiver and we'll have all the news as it comes in. Plus, more players are going to make their announcements. We're still waiting on guys like Curtis Jacobs and hopefully that is in the near future. And when it does happen, it'll all be right here on Locked On Nittany Lions. And as always, thanks so much for making Locked On Nittany Lions your first listen and your first watch. For your second listen and watch, check out Locked On College Basketball. It's a brand new podcast. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place, plus hear from big names, experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts.